For half a century, colossal steam locomotives ruled American rails. Then, in 1939, a strange machine appeared. A diesel so unproven and odd that railroad bosses dismissed it as a smelly tin box. In a single trial, it accomplished what five of the country's biggest steam engines could not. How did one unlikely locomotive upend an entire industry and erase more than a century of tradition? To understand, you first need to see the burdens steam crews faced every single day. Every morning on the steam-powered railroads began long before sunrise. Crews gathered at the roundhouse, where engines waited cold and silent. The fireman's first job was to coax life into the boiler, shoveling coal for hours, just to build enough steam for departure. Even after the locomotive rolled onto the main line, the work never let up. A single freight run demanded constant attention. The firemen fed the roaring firebox, the engineer watched the gauges, and the brakemen moved between cars, ready to set handbrakes or couple extra engines for the steepest grades. On heavy freights, it was common to link up four or five massive steam locomotives, each with its own crew. That meant 20 men or more, all working in shifts, coordinating every stop and signal across hundreds of miles. The train's progress was measured not just in miles, but in water towers and coal docks. Every hundred miles or so, the whole consist had to halt for water. Steam engines burned through thousands of gallons, and coal bunkers emptied fast under heavy loads. At each stop, roundhouse staff swarmed the engines, clearing ash from fireboxes, checking bearings, and topping up supplies. Timetables were built around these pauses and delays piled up when engines needed more time or a crew fell behind. For the men who kept the trains moving, the job was relentless. Soot-stained faces, hands blistered from shovels, and every shift ended with another round of maintenance before the next run. The sheer scale of effort behind every mile of steam-hauled freight shaped the rhythm of American industry. Then something arrived that promised to change everything. Late in 1939, a new kind of locomotive rolled out of the Electromotive Corporation's shop. At first glance, EMC 103 looked nothing like the polished giants of the steam era. Instead of a single hulking boiler, it stretched out as a string of four boxy units, drawbar connected from end to end. The lead and trailing units, called A units, had cabs for engineers, while the two center B units were cabless housing pure machinery. Together, this ABBA set measured nearly 200 feet and weighed close to 900,000 pounds. Inside, the heart of the machine was Richard M. Dilworth's design, the 567 series diesel engine. Each unit packed a 16-cylinder, two-stroke prime mover, generating 1,350 horsepower apiece, 5,400 horsepower in total, all transmitted to the rails through electric traction motors. The architecture was unlike anything seen before on American mainlines. Instead of fireboxes and water tanks, EMC 103 carried fuel for hundreds of miles. With dynamic brakes developed alongside the Santa Fe to control heavy trains on mountain grades. The builder's plate on the nose read simply EMC 103 but to railroad men used to polished brass and clouds of steam, its ribbed metal sides and flat nose seemed almost industrial, even crude. The exhaust carried a sharp tang of diesel fuel, a scent that lingered in the air long after the train passed. Yet beneath the sheet metal, every inch was engineered for endurance. Dilworth's philosophy was simple build a locomotive that could do the work of a whole fleet of steam engines, but with fewer moving parts and less daily attention. This odd, four-part machine was about to challenge a century of tradition. Trade journals filled with biting commentary as the EMC-103 made its rounds. Editors questioned whether a diesel, built like a string of metal boxes and reeking of oil, could ever handle the work of a real locomotive. Railroad veterans, many with decades behind the throttle, 
scoffed at the idea that this newcomer could replace the muscle of five steam giants. The 103's humming engines and mechanical clatter sounded foreign compared to the deep, familiar pulse of steam. In Union Halls, the mood was even less forgiving. For firemen and roundhouse crews, the diesel meant more than just a change in technology. It threatened jobs that had been handed down for generations. Meeting minutes from the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Firemen show heated debates over what would happen if one machine could do the work of five. Some called it a passing fad, while others worried aloud about the future of their craft. Rumors spread that management saw the diesel as a way to cut payrolls and sidestep the careful dance of crew assignments that kept so many men working. Skeptics dismissed the EMC-103 as an untested gadget, a risk for any railroad foolish enough to trust it with heavy freight. Yet beneath the sarcasm and suspicion, a challenge began to take shape. If the diesel really could match the output of five steam locomotives, it would have to prove it, not just in the shop or on paper, but out on the rails, under the toughest conditions the railroad could throw at it. The demonstration would not be decided by opinions or tradition. Railroad officials and engineers sat down to draft the rules, determined to make the test as demanding and as fair as possible. The EMC-103 would be coupled to a freight train weighing 3,150 tons, a load that typically required four or five steam locomotives working together. The chosen route was no gentle proving ground. It included grades as steep as 1.6%, enough to humble even the largest steam engines. No helpers would be allowed. The diesel had to haul the entire train unaided from the starting yard to the final destination. Every ton counted. Every mile of track had to be covered under its own power. The test would be run over mainline territory, known for punishing climbs and sharp curves, territory where steam engines often stalled or called for pushers. Schedules were set to match or beat the best times posted by steam. There would be no allowances for breakdowns or delays. The officials insisted on strict adherence to the tonnage and speed requirements, with observers from both the railroad and electromotive riding along to log every detail. Any failure to maintain the schedule or complete the run would be logged as a strike against the diesel. The challenge was clear. One four-unit diesel consist 5,400 horsepower, 3,150 tons of freight, up to 1.6% grades and not a single extra locomotive allowed. If the EMC-103 faltered, the skeptics would have their proof. If it succeeded, the old ways of railroading would be on borrowed time. Dispatchers who managed the test run of the EMC-103 were used to planning around the limits of steam. On any long haul, their schedules were shaped by the need to stop every hundred miles for water, coal, or quick repairs. Even the best steam locomotives could only go so far before they needed a break, and every stop meant lost time and more work for the crews. But the EMC-103 changed that calculation overnight. With a full tank, each unit in the four-part consist held 1,200 gallons of diesel fuel, enough for more than 500 miles without stopping. For the first time, a heavy freight could run from division point to division point on a single fill, skipping every water tower, coal dock, and roundhouse along the way. The impact on operations was immediate. Trains that once crawled through the night, pausing in small towns so men could refill tenders and clear ash, now rolled straight through. Schedules tightened. Freight arrived hours sooner. Instead of orchestrating a relay of crews and servicing stops, Dispatchers could keep the EMC-103 moving mile after mile, only pausing for crew changes or to let faster passenger trains by. The new diesel did not just save time, it freed up track slots that had always been blocked by steam's constant need for attention. As the 103 ran its demonstration circuit, railroad officials watched the line clear ahead, the old bottlenecks vanishing with each nonstop run. 
The promise was clear, a locomotive that could keep going as long as the railroad itself, rewriting what was possible for freight across the continent. Inside the cab of the EMC 103, the world of railroad labor was being rewritten in real time. Where five steam locomotives once meant a parade of engineers, firemen, and brakemen, 20 men or more spread across the length of a heavy freight, now only two people sat at the controls. The engineer handled the throttle and brakes, while a single assistant monitored gauges and watched the track ahead. There was no fireman shoveling coal, no need for a brakeman to crawl between cars for manual couplings, and no hostler waiting at the next division point. The diesel's design made this possible, with electric traction motors and automated systems, and most of the physical labor vanished. Railroad rule books had always dictated crew sizes based on the needs of steam. Unions, wary of job losses, pushed back hard against the idea that a train this long could run so lean. Early demonstration runs sometimes included extra crew partly to satisfy union contracts and partly to reassure skeptical officials. But the technical reality was clear. The EMC-103 could do the work of five engines with just two operators in the lead cab. For the men who rode the diesel, it was a different kind of job. There was no heat from the firebox, no coal dust in the air, and no rhythm of shovels against steel. Instead, the cab filled with the steady hum of engines and the faint scent of oil. The engineer's focus shifted from managing a team to managing a machine, reading dials, listening for changes in the growl of the prime mover, and watching the rails stretch out ahead. The railroad's payroll ledger told the rest of the story. A single run that once paid 20 men now needed only two. For the industry, this was more than a technical leap. It was a fundamental change in what it meant to move freight across the continent. On the morning of the test, Railroad officials and skeptical crews lined the tracks, waiting to see if the EMC-103 could do what no diesel had done before. The train, a string of 68 loaded freight cars weighing in at over 3,100 tons, waited for the signal. The engineer eased open the throttle, and the four-unit diesel set began to move. There was no plume of steam, no deafening roar, just the steady thrum of 16-cylinder engines winding up beneath the metal hoods. As the consist picked up speed, the starting tractive effort registered at 228,000 pounds, all of it delivered to the rails through electric traction motors. Veteran brakemen watched the couplers stretch and settle, half expecting the diesel to stall or slip on the grade. Instead, the train climbed smoothly, holding its footing where steam engines had often struggled. Logs from the run, tell the story in numbers. The EMC-103 kept its pace on the steepest 1.6% grades, never once needing a helper or a pause to catch its breath. The crew, used to the constant vigilance of steam, found themselves with little to do but monitor gauges and call out mileposts. At division points where steam locomotives would have stopped for water or coal, the diesel rolled on, its fuel reserves barely dented. Observers riding in the cab scribbled notes as the train crested summits and powered through curves, the engines never faltering. By the end of the run, even the most hardened skeptics on board admitted they had seen something new. The EMC-103 had hauled its massive load from start to finish without a single stall or breakdown, matching, if not surpassing, the best times set by steam. Crew members later recalled their astonishment some shaking their heads at the memory of a diesel doing the work of five engines without breaking a sweat. The verdict was in, written not by engineers in a lab, but by the men who had spent their lives behind the throttle. Railroad accountants, poring over the numbers from the EMC-103's demonstration runs, found themselves facing a new kind of math. Every mile the diesel covered delivered savings that steam had never offered. The cost ledgers from those first tests show the difference in black and white. Fuel expenses alone dropped by more than half. Diesel oil was cheaper by the ton, and the locomotive burned less of it per mile than five steam engines burned coal. But the real surprise came when labor and maintenance were tallied up. 
With only two crew members instead of 20, payroll costs shrank overnight. There were no overtime charges for firemen, no extra pay for brakemen or hostlers at every division point. The EMC-103 did not need to stop for water or coal, so the train kept moving, eliminating the downtime that had always padded the books. Instead of daily visits to the roundhouse for boiler washes and ash removal, the diesel required only a monthly oil and filter change. The maintenance budget, once swollen by the relentless demands of steam, suddenly looked lean. EMD's own reports claimed that when all expenses were counted, the cost of running the FT demonstrator was as much as 70% lower than the equivalent steam consist. Even if some railroad managers doubted the exact figure, no one could ignore the direction of the numbers. For the first time, the business case for diesel power was not just about new technology, it was about dollars and cents. The EMC-103 did not just run faster or farther, it ran cheaper, and that fact landed harder than any engineering argument. Maintenance logs from the EMC-103's demonstration runs tell a story that would have seemed impossible in the age of steam. Instead of daily trips to the roundhouse, the diesel required only a single scheduled monthly servicing. Mechanics recorded oil changes, filter swaps, and quick checks of traction motors. Those were jobs that could be completed in a few hours, not the all-night rituals of boiler washing and ash removal. The 567 series prime movers, designed by Richard Dilworth, were built for endurance. Each engine ran for hundreds of hours, between checkups, with no need for the constant tightening, greasing, and cleaning that steam demanded. During its 83,764-mile tour across 20 railroads, the EMC-103 did not suffer a single major road failure, a powerful demonstration of reliability. Shop crews kept detailed records, noting only routine wear and minor adjustments. Nothing stopped the locomotive on the main line or delayed a freight. In contrast, steam engines often limped into division points with hot bearings, leaky tubes, or fouled fireboxes, sometimes requiring hours or even days of repair before their next run. For the planners who managed locomotive assignments, this new reliability changed everything. A diesel that could run for weeks on end without downtime meant fewer spare engines tied up in reserve, fewer disruptions to the schedule, and a dramatic drop in emergency repairs. The numbers were clear. One machine could replace not only the work of five, but also the headaches that came with keeping a steam fleet rolling. For the first time, the future of mainline freight looked predictable. No longer at the mercy of soot, steam, and breakdowns, but powered by a machine that simply kept going. Today, nearly every freight train in North America runs on diesel power, a direct legacy of one bold experiment. As automation and alternative fuels push railroads toward another crossroads, the lesson endures. Skepticism can't stop innovation that proves itself on the tracks. Progress rarely looks like tradition, but it reshapes our world all the same. What change will we dismiss next?